A healthy community is key to economic sustainability. To thrive, we need to collectively invest in the area's built environment and the well-being of people who live there. That is the vision for Dreamland on 38th, the Cultural Wellness Center's bold and inspiring capital project in South Minneapolis. In a legacy African-American district, Dreamland was a real place where African-Americans gathered, socialized, and celebrated their humanity together in community in a red-lined area of Minneapolis. Remarkably, Dreamland rose out of the ashes and the horror of Tulsa, Oklahoma, and the destruction of Black Wall Street. Dreamland is part of our geography, our history, our aspirations. Since 1996, the mission of the Cultural Wellness Center has been to unleash the power of people to heal themselves and build community. As a culturally rooted African-American nonprofit, the organization has shown when culture and community knowledge are studied and valued, they are powerful tools for health, healing, community building, and economic development. Atu Matsahir is the founder and longtime executive director of the Cultural Wellness Center. For decades, she has mentored key leaders across the Twin Cities and, indeed, the world. While many of us call her Mother Atum or Elder Atum, my guest, Anthony Taylor, simply calls her Mom. Anthony, why are we here at the Midtown Global Market? You know, the, the Midtown Global Market um, is a collaboration um, between NDC, Neighborhood Development uh, Center, and the Cultural Wellness Center. Um, it is also um, a really important time landmark relative to Lake Street. Um, and, I, and I think that it, it just, it has some symbolism that I think is really critically important uh, for us to really understand um, M Minneapolis and, and in some regards, uh, Minnesota. The Cultural Wellness Center is a part owner of this great public place. Yeah, when, when, the, when the global market was reestablished as a, as a project, um, it was really important that the ownership also be connected to community. And so this collaboration, this ownership structure, and that matter of fact, initially there were other partners, including uh, uh, Latino Economic Development Corp. Um, but really it was established as a really a community catalyst um, that was designed to uh, acknowledge culture as an asset uh, and that to build uh, entrepreneurship uh, to really spur economic development from this perspective of culture, which is really uh, critically important to us understanding Lake Street. The vision of Dreamland on 38, this cultural renewal idea, seems an oddly juxtaposed to 38th Street of notorious memory as the street on which George Floyd was murdered. You have big ideas about changing the narrative while keeping the memory of the moment alive from Lake Street down to 38th in Minneapolis. Yeah, Dreamland on 38th um, is actually um, started out as a very small development project. Uh, the Cultural Wellness Center owns a property at 38th and 3rd Avenue. And uh, we started out really with the idea that ultimately the goal was to do some type of little mobility effort. I mean, in, in, in lay parlance, we were just going to do a cool bike shop. That was really the idea. And as we, as we looked into the project, uh, it turns out at one point it was a gas station, which required us to do some soil remediation. And, and then we really began to explore a bigger project. And as we began to think about this, really the cultural wellness approach really requires us to really think uh, through time. And so we really begin to investigate uh, the his history of the community uh, to really understand um, the impacts on those communities, to understand who has lived there, what's gone on. And one of the things that we found was that uh, 38th Street um, had actually had a, a really amazing history um, that it is, I think many people I know that, and maybe many people don't know, that 38th and 4th was a legacy African-American community in South Minneapolis. Um, there was a, a bustling business community there. There was a growing black middle class. Um, and all of this uh, into the 80s and 90s. Um, but the roots of that um, really is, were established because it was actually redlined. Um, and there was a place where African Americans were allowed to live in South Minneapolis. And, and again, um, it grew out of that. Our definition of a 
cultural district or a cultural community is one where we can point to the ways, uh, for example, it begins with redlining, relegation, or abandonment by a majority community. And when these communities move into these spaces, what they do is they immediately begin to build uh, infrastructure, economic infrastructure, um, based on their culture. And when we look back far enough at 38th and 4th, what we found was uh, an amazing human. Um, his name is Anthony B. Cassius. And Mr. Cassius uh, moved here from Oklahoma after the, you know, the demolishment of Black Wall Street uh, as, a, as, a, as, a, as a teenager. He and his brother moved here. Uh, he began to work in the Twin Cities, uh, began to work in organizing in the, in the downtown hotels. And what he did at 38th and 4th was he opened a business called Dreamland Cafe. And this is 1937. And when you read into his uh, autobiography or at the Minnesota Historical Society, you can actually hear him talking about this. He immediately talks about what we now would use the, the, the parlance of a social impact business. He actually talks about opening Dreamland Cafe as a place where these young hotheads could come and conspire for the cost of a soda. Um, and he talks about the impact of the community of this safe space. And this is 1937. And, and that, was a, that was a monumentally similar moment for me because that's really what we're thinking about again today. So it made perfect sense that we would really talk about this business as Dreamland on 38th. But as I looked at it broadly, what I realized about 38th Street was that 38th also had had another impact um, that we had not really, don't always acknowledge, is that 35W um, runs per perpendicular to 38th Street. Well, what happened at 38th Street is the same thing that happened in Rondo that fundamentally 35W comes through there and bifurcates 38th Street east of the highway and 38th Street west of the highway. And if you go there today, you can stand at the location of 35W and you can look west and see prosperity and vitality and you can look east and you will see still vacant lots, you will see less people moving on the street, less mobility, and, and it is an absolute result of that. And it's absolutely contrary to the way the community existed before that, where there was vitality, there were businesses on four corners, there was a record store, which we don't do anymore, barber shops, beauty salon, grocery store, social clubs. One of the markers of cultural communities that we are really clear about is the creation of social infrastructure that is really designed to do nothing more than validate the humanity of the community members who live there. And all of this existed right at 38th and 4th and along 38th Street. Why is there such a difference between the east and west on 38th Street from the focal point of 35W? The legacy African-American community was east of 35W. The, 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 the choice of where to put 35W had a disproportionately negative impact on the African-American community. And, and that that was a choice. I mean, that, and that's what we see in terms of policy. When we look at the overlay of the redlining maps from 1937 and we compare a current day map of the highway system that runs through Minneapolis, what you will see is that the highway system directly mirrors those communities that were redlined. Rondo community, North Minneapolis, South Minneapolis, um, Seven Corners uh, near the University of Minnesota. And, and it is really, uh, again, it's proof of the intention. And that really is what we experienced. Again, that, that, that loss of economic vitality and really a demise of the African-American Economic Enterprise District uh, that, that existed at 38th and 4th and south along 4th Street, even further south. It is an ugly part of urban design history that these vibrant, often African-American heritage districts, commercial districts, become sacrifice zones zones of a community that were sacrificed for what the dominant culture called the greater good, but in actual terms, the powerful decided that these people, this community, just didn't count. 
It, it, it really is a, is a historical example of, of power and influence. You know, I mean, and I think that's, you're absolutely right. One, uh, they, they already had the lowest property values, right? They had the lowest political agency in a community, lowest, you know, the, the least uh, influence on local government. And so absolutely, uh, that, that is, is really the case. And um, it is, it's really sad, as you said, to see the national footprint of that exact reality all over this country. Anthony, I want to be careful here. If the black community was forced to live in a confined area because of redlining and deed restrictions, this idea of recreating the vitality of the African-American community on 38th can be seen as capitulating to segregation that started it. Or is it turning a negative into a positive? You know, I, you know what's interesting about that is I, I think that really what we're doing is um, there's an acknowledgement of the negative past that's really critical for us to understand what happened. And that does something special. And I think one of the things I think about is it actually um, helps the community that has gone through that experience understand that it is not them, right? That, it, that it's not their character or the choices they made, that this was really political will that was working against them. And simultaneously what we're saying is that culture is your greatest asset. So we're really looking at what was happening there as a way that culture was really the fuel. It was the motivation. And so that we think uh, that in this community, what we're really doing is reclaiming that legacy, I, you know, kind of identifying it as an African-American legacy cultural district, because African-American people still live there, right? What we're doing is we really want to bring uh, that knowledge forward and really turn that into intention. Because that kind of kind of collective, collaborative will, which is that's the legacy of that community, there's a great opportunity to do that. And it, and it doesn't matter if all the resources are African American. We really see this is a collaboration on 38th Street between Sabathony, you know, a legacy African American organization, you know, Seward Co-op, which is uh, a really a, a white, you know, uh, created organization that has a commitment to social justice, collaborating with Kente Circle, which is an organization that is committed to mental health, using culture as a foundation for that, the Cultural Wellness Center. We really ultimately see this as a deep collaboration with the city of Minneapolis because we are just a few blocks from where George Floyd was murdered. And we know that what's going to emerge there is part of this continuum, right? Um, it's really critical and important that we understand that. And so what we know is that this area ultimately will be a, a, a destination for international social justice, racial justice pilgrims from all over the world. That's what it's become. And so now we have elevated this being. This is not just about, you know, just African-American community broadly. We are saying that it is based in an African-American cultural legacy, and this is going to be a future destination for social justice pilgrims from all over the world. This is a 50, 100, 150-year vision for a way that we're going to serve the world, and, I, and that is incredibly empowering. 38th and 3rd is going to be world headquarters for the Cultural Wellness Center, um, but it also is going to be a place where, where the community will have access. I mean, you know, we have plans for approximately a 10,000 square foot building. Uh, the main floor of that building will fundamentally be a community space where people will be able to, to celebrate um, you know, themselves, their families, uh, the community. Um, and we're doing something interesting there um, that connects us back to the global market where we are connected around around food and it's a, a you know really food is a foundation around great culture is that one of the things that we saw there was that there was um, a disparity in terms of success right so first of all cultural communities choose food in a very high amount as an entrepreneurial pursuit it is the hardest business you can go into okay um, and entrepreneurship is already hard at the global market, what we found was there was a disproportionate failure rate in African-American-owned businesses. And, and, and our work there was began, beginning to support them in being more successful. And what we really found was there was some unique aspects to supporting them and offering technical assistance that was cultural. 
that there was something related to the legacy of being an African-American in this country, um, to the ways that we um, do business, that we relate to each other, that were really important to, in, in, as we offered technical assistance and support and created traditional kind of financial systems, marketing systems, um, and all those things. Well, we learned that there. We really used this kind of cultural wellness approach in that entrepreneurship training and support. And what we want to offer here is an incubator. You know, we really um, are dubbing it a co-cafe, actually, uh, which is a co-working cafe where we will have multiple entrepreneurs. Um, we're going to be prioritizing. African American entrepreneurs. Um, we're going to be tying them to a, a, a culturally based support system that begins to look at their marketing, their financial support, look at shared staffing there, uh, looking at connecting them to a network of successful cultural entrepreneurs in the food industry as well, and really allowing them to um, grow, to make mistakes, but continually offer the, the, you know, the service and, 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 what, and the love they want to offer to the community because that's they go into the business for love. And, um, but do it in a way where there's iterative growth for them, where they're getting support for that. And do it in a way where there's multiple levels of opportunity. So we really see something as simple as for that person in the community who has just a great cookie or a great pie, we're going to have an offering of a market where they can actually sell that and make that available in the community. And then scale up a little bit. And maybe then what they'll be able to do is sell that to the food entrepreneurs that are actually anchored at Dreamland. And then those businesses, based on their growth, are going to be in different scale. Because there are going to be four to six entrepreneurs at any given time there. And again, they're going to be working in a way where we're always creating an event by having them change days, share staff, share financial support, but always never be at total risk in the hardest business in the world. And because they're getting support from, from cultural entrepreneurs that are already in the business, that are successful, what we're doing is we're building what really matters in terms of ultimate success, particularly for cultural entrepreneurs, is relational infrastructure, right? Capital, you know, relational capital. Um, is really foundational for support. So we really see uh, Dreamland Co-Cafe as a place where entrepreneurs in that developmental level will be able to get those anchors of support and, and really uh, increase the possibility of being successful in you know, the toughest uh, entrepreneurial pursuit that they could go after. Anyone with even a passing interest in how neighborhoods come into being will note that one of the first things you see in any culture, any racial group, is a new restaurant serving food for the body and the soul. Familiar foods that say, come on in, you belong here. Well, and, and again, so now we're back to Mr. Cassius's first, <laughs> first anchoring of this and this idea of that we're, what if, what if we really do think about social impact? Right, right. And, and this idea of validation, like you said, what you recognize, not only do you recognize the food, the place and the food recognize you. There's an aspect of this that is reciprocal that we don't always, uh, aren't always clear about. And it, it really is a place where community comes together, but it's also where you celebrate, right? It is also uh, anchored in really the emotional well-being um, and really cultural businesses generally are always multifaceted, right? It's not just the place where you get great food. It's where you find the best insurance program, right? It's where you find out where's the shortest line for immigration papers, right? Um, it, it really is this a communal meeting place and sharing place. And, and again, uh, it's, it's really sharing from trusted sources. Mr. Cassius also had the Nakarima Club, which you built and ran. It was a night spot. Uh, People would dress up and have an evening of entertainment and closeness, culture, community at the same time. Well, the, you know, you, you said food is, the, is, a, is a place that shows up in cultural communities. The other place is, you know, is some place that plays music, right? And so the Nakarima Club, and, and for those of you who know that, you know, Nakarima is American spelled backwards. So there's always a play on things, uh, on the words, and the Nakarima Club... Um, actually had membership. I mean, that, that's, what I, that's what, again, when I talk about social institutions. So really, it looks like a, a music venue, but really it's, it's something really building social instituting, validating humanity and identity. And 
it's a place where you can come, but it's also a place where you could start. So again, this is where Prince and Jimmy Jam, Terry Lewis, you know, are doing uh, music early in their career. Um, it's a place where um, the community, again, is um, validating, again, why they live, why they exist, and also renewing itself. I, you know, I mean, we talk about, you know, it's funny, and, and talk to young people, and they understand healing spaces. <laughs> you know, they use that language all the time, but I don't think we often think about a music venue as that way. But it absolutely was in 1957, 1967, right? It was a place where you could go and be validated and, and experience healing. If the Cultural Wellness Center is successful and has a great history of success, this really is a dream come true. It, you know, the, the work that the Cultural Wellness Center has done in community, you know, really began with this very clear um, realization, right, was that culture is a fundamental asset for building. And so really what we're doing is really um, bringing that to 38th Street. Because really it isn't just the Cultural Wellness Center. As I said, I mean, this is, this is there are many, many community partners um, all the way down the boulevard who have been doing small pieces of this work and many have been there for a very long time. What we're, what we're really doing, I think, is, is changing the narrative to one that actually acknowledges the history, the present, and the future simultaneously. Like that, that, that's the cultural wellness approach, you know what I mean? And I don't, I don't, I don't want to take credit for that. That is really the cultural wellness philosophy. Um, and that's a very African way to see the world, you know what I mean, that idea. So I think that that's really what's happening right now is that, that we, are, we are really validating the history of this community, how we got here, who has lived here, their struggle, their aspirations. And because their aspirations are aligned with our aspirations for this moment and the aspirations we'll have in the future in terms of our families, ourselves, and our communities, that is a, an opportunity for, again, for us to see this thing where we are the past, the future, and the present come together. And that we can, we can ride forward on that. We invite you to watch more about Dreamland on 38th Street. The links for the video will be provided. And we invite you to dream along with us to return 38th Street to the vibrant center of African-American culture that it once was and will be again.